Okay, our next lecturer, Helio Beltrau, is the rarest of men, a financial and, and ideological entrepreneur who has been stunningly successful in both arenas while remaining uncompromising in his devotion to the principles of a free society as propounded by Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard. Helio trained as an electrical engineer at Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. He received his MBA from Columbia Business School, majoring in finance and graduating with honors. He was an investment banking executive at Banco Garantia, the leading Brazilian investment bank in the 1990s. He was also a hedge fund manager and advisor for merger and acquisition transactions. He's currently a board member of several companies whose businesses range from fuel distribution, chemicals, and logistics to women's fashion and education. He's a co-founder and board member of Instituto Millennium, a libertarian initiative co-founded by leading owners and CEOs, uh, both of media organizations and of some of the largest industrial firms in Brazil. Most important, he's the, the founder and president of Mises Brazil Institute. On a personal note, I had the pleasure of enjoying the, the wonderful hospitality of Helio and his lovely wife, Graziella, last year when he invited me to speak at the first conference held by Mises Brazil. I, I'm also in his debt for introducing me to the Brazilian steakhouse, or Rodizio. Um, <laughs> comparing a Brazilian Rodizio to an American steakhouse is like comparing Austrian economics to Keynesian economics, <laughs> or, or even happiness research. <laughs> so without further delay, I present you Helio. Guys, I apologize because I don't have any books or paper to present to you tonight. <laughs> but I have submitted something to Joe, this. And he had accepted it. So in case you have any problem with my lecture, please uh, take it up with Joe. He's in the first line here. <laughs> uh, it is, um, first, first let me tell you a story. When I arrived at the uh, Atlanta airport, uh, I had a very nice conversation with the immigration officer that reminded me of, uh, of uh, Gary North's uh, lecture last year, uh, which was Keynes and, and, and his influence. Uh, and I guess the immigration officer uh, really liked economics. He asked me, what are you doing in the US? And I said, I'm going to a conference. Where are you going to? So I said, at the Mises Institute of Scholars Conference. And he said, Mises? Who is this guy? He said, an, an economist. Is he alive? I said, no, he, he's, he was dead in 1973. He said, oh, so he must be a Keynesian. <laughs> and I try to control myself as an immigration officer. I said, no, 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 absolutely not. He's a free market guy. And he said, I don't understand. Aren't Keynesians free marketeers? And I asked him, do you have kids, sir? And he said, yes, I do. So do you think guys spending money in Washington and sending the bill to your kids, is that a free market? And, and the guy said, I guess not. <laughs> and he said, uh, do you have kids? I said, yes. So they are paying for it as well. And I said, well, but I'm in Brazil and they're doing a better job and etc." And then he said, sir, we live in a globalized world. She, the, your children are, are paying for it as well. <laughs> and he won the argument. <laughs> My only consolation was that, uh, wait a minute, sir. How do you spell Mises? I want to look it up. And that was good. So it's the, it's the most privileged honor uh, to be here with you uh, and deliver this uh, uh, Mises uh, lecture. I don't know if you know, but it's Carnival in Brazil this week. And, uh, and Brazilians are right now uh, pursuing their uh, constitutional right to pursuit of happiness, <laughs> uh, in the biblical sense. <laughs> but to me, the feast is happening here. So it's a pleasure to be here. I, I thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, Joe wanted uh, me to speak about, uh, about how Misesian ideals could change uh, Brazil and Latin America. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, what I really want to talk about is uh, Austro-libertarianism, that is our freedom philosophy, 
whose pillars are the non-initiation of force and uh, private property, and related to two aspects. First of all, my experience as part of, uh, as an executive of a performance-based organization, uh, the one founded by Brazilian partners led by Jorge, Jorge Paulo Lehmann, uh, who, who are now the controlling shareholders of anheuser Bush in Bath, uh, whose CEO is today uh, Carlos Brito, and they own several other companies, but that's the, the most famous one. Uh, so I want to relate austro libertarianism to that uh, experience and from these uh, great guys on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, I would like to relate austro libertarianism uh, and our freedom movement to uh, the book Starfish and the Spider. I don't know if you're familiar with it, so uh, let me start with the flavor of the book. It's a five-year-old book that talks about what exactly is uh, a decentralized organization, its strengths, its weaknesses, and, and, it, and they compare, the authors compare it to, to two animals whose structure superficially looks similar. The spider on the one hand and the starfish on the other. Uh, the spider has a central body, eight legs. The starfish, central body, five arms. Internally, however, their biology is completely different. If you cut a leg of a spider, what you get is a seven-legged uh, crippled spider. If you cut the head, though, it dies. It cannot live without its command center. Uh, we are familiar uh, a lot with uh, spider organizations, be it a government, corporations, uh, and even traditional think tanks. Uh, they have boards, they have CEOs, hierarchies, headquarters, etc. Now, the starfish, if you cut an arm of a starfish, it will grow one back. And if you cut the starfish in half, an amazing thing happens. Two organisms survive, two different starfish survive. There's even a species of starfish uh, called the linkia, that if you cut all five arms of it, it will grow five separate organisms. So each arm has its own different organs. The, uh, each arm has its own stomach, its own muscles, its own way of feeding itself, and there's no central organ, except for a nerve ring that connects the arms. That's a decentralized organization, organism in this case. When you look at the world today, there are more and more starfish organizations that are sprouting. And at our own Austro-Libertarian freedom movement, I would argue that we are starting to behave like an adaptable, hard to combat starfish. With each institute or any other organized initiative behaving as an arm of the starfish, and the nerve ring being the Austrian libertarian doctrine. But I'll get back to that. First of all, let me say a few words about Brazil. Brazil has always had a status mentality. For example, why in the US you would ask a person how much do you make? In Brazil you would ask how much do you receive? As if it were a gift or a grant. Uh, as opposed to the get what you give mentality in the US. My father used to say uh, that Brazil is an island of initiative completely surrounded by government. <laughs> and Brazil also has an ingrained red tape mentality. And there's another sentence by my father. He, he used to say that Brazilians place more trust in the death certificate than in the presence of the dead body itself. We, we were famous, famous back in the 80s for holding a world record. And I bet uh, uh, Joe knows about that. It was the world record of inflation. Uh, and even between 1990 and 1994, less than 20 years ago, the average annual inflation in Brazil was above 1,000%. 
At the peak, prices would rise 1% every day, uh, according to the official inflation index, which had a daily adjustment. Of course, prices could rise a little bit more or less according to supply and demand, but there, everything would rise, all prices would rise according to the official inflation. So in all retail sh shops, everything was being marked up every day. And also investments were being marked up every day. If you have uh, had any savings, it would go up any, uh, every day, even your current account. Uh, wages, though, they were adjusted only every month or every 15 days, depending on the company you work for. So you see the wage earners were the losers in this process. And uh, as they received their salaries, uh, they would go straight to uh, the huge hypermarkets we had in Brazil at the time to purchase non-perishables. That was the way that uh, they used to defend themselves. But by 1994, after about uh, 20 years or so of very high inflation, uh, the Brazilian people had had enough of this corrosive inflation of exchange rates, super devaluations, and government surprise plans and packages to confiscate uh, savings, and that were usually accompanied by week-long bank holidays, and demanded a halt. So politicians finally decided to act because they were suffering. We had presidents being impeached, central bank presidents were being changed every six months or so, uh, everything was in chaos. So the government had to do something. So what they did, they increased taxes, which is bad, but they did that uh, and also balanced the budget, drastically decreased money creation, and floated the currency. Since then, we are now considered a normal country. That is a, 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 like a social democracy with a big government, like an European country or so, because we took care in Brazil of the most pressing problems, which were very high inflation, uh, government finances out of control, and balance of pay payment problems that would cause uh, exchange rate uh, super devaluations. We are now then reaping the benefits of that commitment for stability, uh, while the rest of the world, on the other hand, and also America, is doing the exact opposite and running uh, the government, government's running huge deficits and printing money like crazy. And we Brazilians know very well <laughs> that this is a disastrous scenario, so I, I wish you good luck. <laughs> the first organized effort in Brazil to promote the ideas of liberty was uh, the, uh, the founding of the Instituto Liberal in Rio de Janeiro back in 1982 by a construction businessman called Donald Stewart. He started the Instituto Liberal basically to translate and publish uh, books, ba basically the books we like, uh, the libertarian line, Mises, austro libertarian, etc. Donald himself translated human action and interventionism. Uh, the Instituto Liberal was initially very successful. So uh, business people from other capitals decided to start in a decentralized fashion their own Instituto Liberals in other capitals of Brazil. Uh, and they had substantial funding. There are a few business people in six or seven capitals of Brazil that decided to, to do that. Uh, the problem was that uh, they, most of those funders had a special interest agenda, their own interest, and didn't stick to the libertarian line as adopted by, by Donald Stewart. So the substantial money that they raised was spent in bad books and lavish headquarters. So the pseudo network of Instituto Liberals didn't have the libertarian nerve ring uh, connecting the cells and capitulated to those special interests. So they shared the same name, but segregated into different creatures, not a single creature, losing its status as a functioning network. The Instituto Liberal in Rio is still around. It was always small, but it has shrinked further, and it's only a shadow of uh, what it was in its early years. At the same time, in about 1983, a group of people from Porto Alegre in the south of Brazil started an elite study group for uh, entrepreneurs, uh, an elite leadership study group for entrepreneurs, should I say, with a free market doctrine. They also started an annual conference that is now on, the, on its 24th edition, 
which is called the Fórum da Liberdade, and which had last year 6,000 people attending. It's uh, definitely the largest libertarian gathering in Brazil and maybe uh, uh, South America. Mises Brazil was officially founded immediately uh, with the conference immediately before the uh, last year's Forum da Liberdade, and it was a success with uh, 200 people attending per day. We had two days, and there were mostly young people that already followed us uh, through the site and uh, and through the, our publications. Lou, Joe, Mark, Tom were there. Uh, we had very positive coverage uh, by the mainstream media. The two main uh, weekly magazines in Brazil, with over 1.5 million copies in circulation uh, weekly, had two full pages on us uh, and two very positive stories on us. Uh, in the liberal libertarian spectrum, uh, we are already the largest by following base, uh, arguably the largest in Portuguese in the world, uh, with over 3,000 people uh, visiting our site every day. And we already published uh, sev 17 books, either published or republished books that are, are long uh, out of print. The Forum da Liberdade that Joe was there uh, had at its theme Mises and the economic policy book, uh, which we call in Brazil the Six Lessons. Uh, each of the 6,000 participants got a copy of the Six Lessons. Tom spoke at the forum. Each panel of the forum was modeled after a chapter of the book, one of the lessons. And they also had a wonderful exhibit quoting uh, Mises and heralding pictures and stories about his life. We are hosting our second conference uh, next month where we have a speakers uh, Hopper, Holzman, Murphy, Klein, and others. We, and we expect a larger public uh, than last year. So the mainstream media is beginning to pay attention to us. And in summary, we have huge, huge challenges, uh, and we're just starting. We started uh, basically last year, uh, but we are on a roll, so uh, that's great. Uh, so much for Mises Brazil. Let's get back to Austro-Libertarianism and our big challenges. In my opinion, we have some of the best ideas and the best people developing ideas. So why are we still a marginal fringe movement and school of economics? We are standing on the shoulders of giants like the scholastics of Bastiat, Menger, Mises, Rothbard, the present day stars, Hayek. Our ideas have better explanatory power of the consequences of government intervention than any other competing uh, theory. Our ideas are consolidated. They have been tested for over a hundred years, even more. So ideas are not holding us back. So which barriers are making us drag? What's more, we are small, we are bottom up, we are voluntary, we are flexible, and the status organizations, starting with the government itself, but also the UN, the IMF, whatever, they, they are big, they are coercive, they are centralized, they are inefficient, slow, corrupt, Think of the Katrina reaction, the disastrous reaction of the government, or the war on drugs, or any other example that we might think uh, uh, they, they, they have behaved uh, badly. So how come we do not dominate mainstream as we once did, maybe 100 or so years ago? Let me first differentiate how we behave as individuals and how we behave as teams. What is the actual role played by organizations? I mean organizations such as the Mises Institute, such as Mises Brazil, or any other organized effort to promote ideas. Do we actually need them? Can we have a starfish made only by individuals? Or in order to be a well-functioning starfish, we must work with organizations or teams or cells behaving as the arms. Can individuals behave as cells? I would argue it is very difficult to do so, and it's an up, uphill battle for individuals. Freedom lovers and freedom fighting individuals, ourselves, uh, participate in the ongoing battle of ideas. And there are those who discuss and write every day. They are very important. However, 
Individuals alone are not equipped with what's necessary to pursue objective goals in a systematic, organized, and effective way. What we need is, is a great team of great people working together. A great organization, a company, an institute is formed by great people working together, period. Not ideas, not books. It is formed by people that understand the social environment, that, ha that have insights, that know how to market the insights, that have the best connections, with help, which helps uh, with funding, and that translate all that behind the objectives. So what I mean by great people are those people that with some years and some training may become better than me, Lou, Joe, Doug, everyone. So those are the guys who make a great team and we need to attract and retain those people. A team of great people needs to filter, to translate and transmit the ideas to journalists, to writers, to editors, and other opinion leaders. And I call opinion leaders those of maybe 15 or 20% of the population that can grasp and act on, a, on an idea. Those are our most obvious uh, customers. Now, think about uh, John Popola and the Hayek versus Keynes uh, video and other short materials that we see from time to time on the internet and inspire us. Maria was telling me, the, uh, remembering me the, about the, uh, reminding me of this story, uh, the video about uh, uh, love with uh, Hayek. I'm in love with Hayek, which is also great. Uh, uh, but these, these examples, I would argue, they, they're wonderful exceptions of individuals working without the support of a great team and doing the almost impossible, guided only by their dream and passion. But if a team of good people could do even more and systematically, for every popola, unfortunately, there are thousands that act individually, spend their time and energy, but are not able to effect change. Good organizations, they are systematic and they are effective. They avoid floating ideas in a disorganized way through channels and forms that might not work. And that happens because they are goal-based. They have metrics, they have goals, they measure them, they benchmark, they are slim, they are adaptable, and they localize, or as we say in Mises Brazil, we tropicalize the product and the strategy. In some places and times, a natural rights approach may be effective. In others, a value-free approach might be more appropriate. In some places, articles might work better than books. In other radio shows or video clips, might be uh, better solutions. Imagine a beer company. Its product is beer. Our product is austro libertarianism. The beer company may have different uh, flavors of beer, different labels of beer, and it's the same with us. Provided, however, there is no toxic substance. They have their quality standards, we have our quality standards. Uh, the product cannot be one that advocates an initiation of force or an attack of private property, of course, but it may have different flavors for different consumers. That's tropicalization. And tropicalization does not only affect ideas and the way we market ideas, but also how you attract talents and funding. Brazil, for example, does not have a, a culture of uh, donations by individuals, nor do we get uh, tax breaks for donations. So what we do at Mises Brazil, we go for sponsorships by big business, and we stay close to the mainstream media. The Brazilian controlling shareholders of the mainstream media in Brazil are very sympathetic to libertarian ideas. Veja, for example, the main weekly magazine, has recently announced they will always write state with a small s. They wrote a marvelous editorial justifying it, and, and that really took us by surprise, and it's something we, we do at Mises Brazil as well, uh, our editorial policy. But whatever we choose to do in terms of marketing or funding, we must always keep our quality standard of the product, as does the beer company. Otherwise, we will fail like the pseudo network of Instituto Liberals failed in Brazil back in the 80s. Okay, so we have ideas, we have different flavors, and a team of great people working together. How do we manage the team? 
An organization, the same as individuals, need dreams. Dreams are natural. Dreams keep us going, be it uh, being with a person, traveling to some place, being employed by some company, uh, doing well at school, buying a car, whatever. So we need dreams. And thinking big takes the same amount of energy than thinking small. So we should always think big. But we need to set realistic dreams and goals. One must know about 80% how to get to those objectives and dreams and may learn 20% along the way. If it is the opposite, if, if you only know 20% how to get there and must learn 80% along the way, that's not an objective. That's an adventure. So it's not a realistic goal. Some individuals do have some goals, such as, for example, end the state. If it were a goal for a real life organization, it would be definitely an adventure. But it's okay if, if it is for an individual, it doesn't affect the team or others. Uh, the only downside may be that this person gets frustrated because it, there is a good chance that it may not happen in his lifetime. But for organizations though, it cannot be an adventure type goal. For uh, our institute in Brazil, uh, we need metrics, we use metrics. And those may be the reach of our ideas in the mainstream media, the internet, book sales, fundraising for projects, or any other performance indicator that correlates well with the uh, objectives, uh, or with the efforts of the team. And <clears throat> what kind of pressure should we put on the future? What kind of pressure should we put on the team? What we know is that we have to constantly uh, raise the bar. That's, that's a given. Too much pressure is bad because people may panic, but too little pressure is bad as well. We are at our best when we are under pressure and we have deadlines. I bet that the people that uh, made this uh, conference perfect were working at their best over the last few days and weeks. Uh, I bet that uh, people would be shutting off their Facebooks and not gossiping too much over the corridors. Uh, and, the, and it was the same with me. Uh, I knew I was going to deliver this lecture for some time, but I really concentrated over the last few days during Carnival. <laughs> so so that, that's the way human beings work. Uh, we need uh, deadlines. We need, uh, we need um, pressure. We need... Um, we need goals like that. And as catalyst managers, team leaders, we need to apply that same kind of pressure all year round, because then people would be at their best. It's like the high jump. If you put uh, the bar here, which person would jump here? Nobody would jump here, because we are rational. We minimize uh, our efforts and energy. You, we'll do like that. So we need to constantly raise the bar and, 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 and keep the pressure. We also need meritocracy, we need candor, and we need informality. Meritocracy. We should reward the best. The best should be promoted to have more space, to have more responsibility. Regardless of seniority, or even uh, regard, uh, regardless of the strict commitment to our ideology. If a person is young and does not yet agree 100% with our ideology, but is very talented, I think he or she should be promoted. We can always train this person with time. That's not a problem as long as he or she helps we reach our objectives. And the risk is if we don't have the courage to do that, the real talented people would see through it and would probably leave the team. And, um, and we may, may be stuck with a mediocre team and that's not, uh, that's not uh, how we, we may reach our goals. Candor, people must know where they stand. They always uh, need constructive and respectful feedback, and they need that, P talented people especially. So you, you should be, here you're doing well, here you need to improve, etc. In the company I used to work for, the Jorge Paulo Lemon Company, uh, the, actually the Banco Garantia, which was the precursor uh, to all the, his ventures, uh, we used to do this uh, twice a year. Uh, and, uh, and we need to constantly have this feedback process operating. 
because we also know that the status quo is not our friend. <laughs> That's exactly what we want to change. So if we need to achieve our dreams, we need this uh, constant feedback working. Sometimes you may have a person who is not delivering. You might feel pity. You might delay the, the decision to let him or her go. You might say, well, he studied under Rothbard, or she's such a nice girl. Let's wait some more time to see uh, if uh, he improves and delivers. It's not going to happen. So in this case, don't, don't waste his or her time. Let her go. Let her pursue uh, her best in, in some place else which might fit better with uh, her abilities. As a professor in a classroom, you would never do that uh, with grades. Grades are grades. You, you have to, there can be no rationalizations. You have to grade people according to their ability because it's the best for the person as well. Uh, for scholarships, the same thing. So people are diff different. We are individuals. That's our philosophy, right? So we need, we need to, to tackle that. Informality. I think that's something that we need, uh, th that we do well because we are small still. Uh, 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 and I think uh, people should be able to speak their mind uh, in open spaces, not, do not get behind closed doors and things like, like that. And I have an example of that. When we decided to, to start Mises Brazil, uh, we didn't yet know Lou, uh, so I sent an email asking whether we could, could translate uh, uh, material and publish uh, material of the Mises Institute. And I got uh, that typical one-liner by Lou just, Please do translate. That's, that's informality. Very, very prompt email, quick response, right to the point. The Brazilians are not very used to that direct. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I love it. I love it. I'm getting used to it. Uh, a great team is, uh, must also raise funds for the projects, be it a conference, books, whatever project uh, we, we want to pursue. And funding for projects, in my experience, is much easier because the sponsor sees the result of, uh, of, the, of his funding, uh, the immediate result of it. But as importantly, we must raise funds to pay for the great team's work. Since we need a team of talented people staying for a whole career, probably, they must know they will be rewarded and that they will have a good life doing this. So we need funding specifically for that as well. But that won't necessarily be endowment funds. And I'll explain that with an example from The Starfish and the Spider, the book. It's the story of the Apache Indians. When the Spaniards arrived in America back uh, in 19, 1519, uh, they found huge empires, uh, Cortes, uh, and his 80 men arrived at central Mexico and found Tenochtitlan, which was uh, one of the largest cities in the world, second only to Constantinople. And it was a centralized empire with Montezuma II as supreme leader. Cortes had a meeting with Montezuma in which he said, give me all your gold and I won't kill you. <laughs> well, what happened is Montezuma did give the gold. He was scared of the powers or of, uh, of the Spaniards and uh, the different things they had. They might have even thought they were gods or something like that. So he gave his gold, but uh, Cortes didn't fulfill his promise. He, he took uh, Montezuma a prisoner and then he killed Montezuma. And uh, what happened is the Azteca people lost completely their drive after the death of uh, Montezuma and crumbled. In very short time, they were quickly defeated. A huge empire quickly defeated. The same happened in South America with the Inca Empire. Pizarro went there with uh, kill the leader, get the ghost strategy, and, and he killed Atahualpa, and uh, same result. A very quick defeat of the Inca Empire. Now, Further north in Mexico, they encountered the Apache. And the Apache were a much less sophisticated people than uh, the Incas or the Aztecas. They had never built a pyramid, never built a paved road or uh, built a town or anything like that. Uh, but they distributed political power. They weren't a coercive leader called the shots people like the Aztecas or the Incas. 
They work voluntarily. They had, without the supreme leader, they had leaders, but they were spiritual leaders which led, who led by example only. They were called the Nantans. And one of the famous Nantans was, of course, Geronimo, who never commanded an army. Uh, when he decided to fight, all Apaches joined him, not because Geronimo said so, but because they thought it was a good idea, because, uh, because of his track record of, of having good ideas. But uh, you didn't need to. Uh, that's the way the Apache uh, made uh, their decisions. When they planned a raid, for example, uh, uh, on the uh, Spanish forces, decisions were made at different places. Uh, an attack m might have been planned in one place, organized in another, and executed at a third place. There's an uh, anthropologist uh, called Tom Nevins that explains that the Spaniards then came in and decided to pursue the same strategy of killing the leaders and started killing Nantans. But immediately after they started to kill Nantans, new Nantans emerged. And, and they also tried to put fire to the villages. And what happened is the Apaches became nomads. Try to catch them now. So the Apaches then unwillingly gained control over territory they didn't, they didn't control before because of this uh, attack by the Spaniards. So they resisted for 200 years. They defeated the Spaniards. The Mexicans came later. They defeated the Mexicans as well. And the Americans were able to defeat uh, the Apache. And the way they did it, uh, and they had already experimented that with, with the Navajo, which is an Apa Apache uh, uh, tribe as well, they gave cattle to the Nantans, to the leaders. They gave resources to the leaders. So now the leaders were able to punish and reward tribe members. So the Nantans started uh, fighting in city councils over control of the resources and built hierarchies and things like that. And that eventually destroyed the Apache society because they became uh, centralized. So. That explains why I, I am skeptical, skeptical, skeptical of endowment funds. Because in, in, uh, with funds like that, people may join the organization to be chasing the funds. It's natural. And people would be looking at those funds over there. So that makes fundraising more difficult because it, it must be a full-time job, a continued full-time job to, to pay for the team's efforts and to, to do the projects. But I would go for that instead of uh, uh, making the same uh, mistake that, uh, the that the Apache made. Another interesting example from the book was the AA, the Alcoholics Anonymous. Which, are, which is totally decentralized. Uh, Bill Wilson, the founder, was an alcoholic himself back in the 30s. And he realized that uh, the treatment that they used to have never worked, which was seeing a specialist, et cetera, because they would rationalize and get home and get a drink. So he found it uh, that uh, it's much more difficult to do that rationalization when you have uh, a group of your peers. So he started AA. And at some point, people started creating different circles of AA, different towns, and he had to make a decision uh, whether to centralize the structure or let it go. And he decided to, to let it go. And the AA uh, became flexible, equal, and mutating uh, because of that. The Apaches, Apaches mutated, becoming nomads, and the AA also mutated, and helps food addicts and, ga and gamblers today. Hey, th they may even mutate to cure Charlie Sheen. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Another example from the book is, uh, is the record industry. Uh, uh, when they faced Napster 10 years ago, it was tough for them to, to fight Napster because Napster was very decentralized. But, but they still had central servers and identifiable CEO and managers. So they, with the lawsuits and et cetera, they, they defeated Napster. And of course, the music, music industry reacted with the P2P networks and et cetera, 
and, and further develop the P2P technology to become anonymous as well, so nobody would know who was trading uh, the, the, the information. But, but in some of those initiatives, the customer's information was still centralized. So these guys were being chased uh, like the Napster, and eventually the music industry again decentralized, and now we have Torrent, and they, 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 can't, they can't get anyone. Uh, we, don't, we don't recognize uh, the industry as it was uh, 10 years ago because of this uh, attack that provoked uh, further decentralization. I would argue that Lou is like Bill Wilson of the AA, not on the alcoholic side. <laughs> I mean, he catalyzed the idea, he built the main cell, and got out of the way for the talents to rise and the cells to spring up, like Brazil and the other efforts that uh, we are seeing today. <coughs> At first, the Mises Institute might look like a spider, it has a board, it has a CEO, it has some hierarchy, a physical address, but look again, Auburn is not where the organization exists. Professors are spread all over the world. There's no formal hierarchy. And we have the Mises and Rothbard's institutes acting independently and at the same time as a network. So if you would thump the Mises Institute on the head, and I'm sorry, Lou, for that, <laughs> Would austere libertarianism die? No. Is there a clear division of roles among the cells? No. Is knowledge concentrated? No. Are the cells self-funded or are they centrally funded? I wish that Lou would throw some checks at us at Brazil, but no, we're not, we not centrally funded. So ladies and gentlemen, we then reach the conclusion that we are genuine starfish. As with the internet, if you would kill half the sites on the internet, it would survive. And the same happens with our movement. We are a cell-based, independent, underground network, and I hope underground not for long. We are building the network as we speak. And since it is an open system, more and more people want to join and contribute, first as individuals, and then, which I think is what really makes a difference as part of teams or independent cells. And if we're talking about people that would like to start an Austro-Libertarian um, organization or cell or something like that, you don't need more than to put up a site or start translating and publishing material or starting a podcast or whatever. Just do it. It's simple and virtually costless. We have done it in Brazil. Gabriel Calçada has done it in Spain. Vlad has done it in Romania. The, the, the Swedish mafia, the Joachins, have done it in, in, in Sweden, uh, Poland, Japan, Chile, Russia, everywhere. Uh, to build a great team, of course, is much more of a challenge. But they are sprouting because we have the example of the Mises Institute and of Lou. When the network fully develops, and the network effect kicks in, the network effect being as the network grows, more and more people want to join and contribute, uh, there will be no stopping us. The centralized statists won't be a match for us. That's it. With that, I'd like to... questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, why do you think you have the uh, support of the uh, Brazilian media as opposed to here where you know, they you know, were extreme? That's a good question. Uh, I don't have an answer to that. I know these people well. Uh, some of them have helped uh, in, in founding, co-founding with me uh, another institute, another initiative called the Instituto Millennium. But I think they are people uh, with uh, values. Uh, they, they support that. Uh, some of them are immigrants and they made it uh, in Brazil uh, despite the government. 
but I, I'm not sure what the answer is, but uh, I'm telling you, uh, uh, Global, which is the main media company in Brazil, uh, their, their shareholders are very sympathetic to liber, uh, libertarian ideas. Uh, Abril, which is the owner of Veja, uh, the second largest media company, they're also very sympathetic to, to the ideas. But I, I'm not sure, I don't know where it comes from. Yep. How much of the Brazilian people, in your opinion, after such a short time ago, going through the crisis of inflation, okay, have realized that the fiat currency is, you know, has all of these inherent problems, and that they're, you know, they migrate towards something else. I mean, is that has that sunk in? I mean, enough into the culture more than here, because I don't think in the United States that it really has sunk in. You know, because our inflation hasn't spiraled out of control mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. You know, that ridiculous hyperinflation. Can you repeat the question? Yes, uh, the question. The question was how Brazilians uh, came to realize and came to react to the, the, the inflation problem and to compare that with the uh, U.S. reality in which you still don't have uh, that high inflation, but uh, you also haven't started uh, reacting fully. That's, is that a fair assessment? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, it's easy to explain the Brazilian side of it because uh, it were it was 20 years of corrosive inflation, continual corrosive, actually started even before when they built Brasilia back in the 50s. So they, they built Brasilia in, in the middle of nothing uh, using printing money. Uh, and, and inflation really started there uh, back in the 50s. And by the 80s, uh, uh, inflation was out of control. And, and Brazilians, uh, they, the Brazilian business people are very smart, uh, uh, so they adapt. And uh, I explained the thing about indexing everything. And it, it behaves a little bit like uh, the uh, Einstein's relativity theory. If the bar is, is rising for everyone at the same time, of course you have money is not neutral, but uh, you have the impression that everything uh, is sort of working. Uh, and it, of course it isn't. It takes time for people to understand that. And Brazil, in the 50s, I think it had about 50% of uh, the US uh, per capita GDP. And still today, it's like 40 after, you know, after rising from 25% or so. So after this huge uh, poverty that arose from that, I think the Brazilian people finally uh, realized they had to act. And that's a problem uh, you might have here. People may still need to see that it's not working for some time. Um, but are they, along with this thought, are the Brazilian people no. No, 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 no. The Brazilian people are not forgetting that at all. Inflation has risen a little bit, but our central bank, I don't know if you know the interest rate in Brazil, 11.75. Tell me how you're going to have bubbles with that, that interest rate. So it's, it's Germanic uh, central banking in Brazil. Uh, so... So they are not forgetting. Politicians don't get elected if inflation really comes back. Of course, it's risen a little bit. And it has risen recently because with the crisis in, in 08, they decided to release some of the reserve requirements. They have now already taken it back. It takes some time to, to work through the process. Uh, it, it, they had done it like maybe four or five months ago. And they have already recent two times 50 basis points. So Brazilians have not forgotten that. Uh, that, that that's not a problem in Brazil. Mateus. What advice would you give to those of us that are trying to accomplish this in America where there's so much media and political and academic resistance to spreading this idea? It seems like Brazil was ready to hear the actual libertarian message. They were ready to look for a solution to the inflation. Here, there's still so much resistance from Harvard and the rest of the wasteland well, what advice could you give to us working in the U.S.? So the question was, what advi advice would I give uh, for, for the U.S. Uh, to react to what's going on and all this money printing, et cetera? Um, uh, and you also mentioned uh, the success we had in Brazil. We didn't have any success in Brazil as far as Austro-Libertarianism yet. 
uh, we have been doing some good stuff recently in Brazil, but uh, I, you know, not much result. And uh, what happened uh, uh, when we decided to stop inflation in 94 was not an Austro-Libertarian thing or anything like that. It was just enough. We had enough, like the Egyptian people or something like that. Um, they had enough, and Brazilians had enough. Uh, I think Venezuela might go through this process uh, in a short time, and even maybe the Cubans. Um, uh, so uh, I don't know what advice would I give. I think uh, I, my actions are the best I can say. I think what works is doing what we do, which is uh, promoting ideas in an efficient way with the most talented people you can find. I think that's, that, that's what works. And being connected as well is very important. Yes? Would you consider the, the Marxist and the progressive groups, um, Starfish, and that they're all pulling together to pull down capitalism? And if you do think that they're Starfish, how do you kill them? <laughs> the, the question was if I think the Marxists are also Starfish. And if I think so, how do we kill uh, the Marxists? <laughs> And I think, I think they are a starfish. Yeah, there's a story about a, a, a starfish in the, in, the, in the coral reef in Australia, and they were not aware uh, of how starfish behave, and they sent uh, divers because uh, the starfish were killing the corals, or, or actually the, the um, um, how do you call it, the, the, the shell, shell-based animals in the corals. And they sent divers there to, to, to kill them, and they, they, actually they multiplied. <laughs> It didn't work, but uh, I think yes, I think the Marxist uh, movement and is a starfish. Uh, Lou told me that in Brazil, uh, that the, the two only global movements uh, are Marxism and austro libertarianism in terms of ideology, organized movements. Um, how do you kill them? I would suggest uh, you read the book, Starfish and the Spider. Uh, it has very good ideas uh, of how to deal with that. But I'll leave it at that. Yes? Uh, when uh, you were talking about the independent cells working, yeah. I just thought, well, that's how the uh, Al-Qaeda and many of the Muslim uh, terrorist uh, cells work, too. Yes. And so um, if uh, we favor smaller government and decentralization and no longer like properly fund things like the CIA or FBI or the military, how do you, do you think these groups are going to go away? Or what do you do about this type of uh, threat and the clash of civilizations and all these other menaces that we have in the world today, in Iran and other things? Right. Uh, the question was, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, also looks like, uh, it behaves like a decentralized organization. And uh, what we then, since we support decentralized organizations, uh, how do we deal with that sort of uh, threat? And I think it's similar to, uh, to, to what we are talking about uh, the Marxists. In some way, there are some uh, starfish which we may consider uh, enemies. And we need to understand how they work. Of course, we have the best ideas on our side. That helps a lot. And if we have also the best management on our side, then I think it makes things uh, much easier. It's very difficult to destroy a starfish. And the book, again, it mentions exactly uh, which strategies uh, you should use to do that. Actually, one of the authors uh, went to the uh, U.S. government to work for the U.S. government for some time. Then he became disappointed. Maybe he understood how centralized organizations worked, uh, and they wouldn't hear him. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm not answering your question. I don't know uh, how to, first of all, if we should go about destroying other people or only do our jobs, and if we for any reason uh, decide to go after them, uh, then we have to study and, and, and see the best we can do. But I think we have ideas, and I hope to have the best people on our side. So that's what we can do today. There's one over there. Yes, earlier in your speech you were describing the, uh, the inflationary curving in Brazil, I suppose, raising the interest rates and whatnot. You, uh, you wish the United States luck. Um, I mean, considering Of Brazil wants to go and take a hit as we enter our hyperinflationary scenario. 
isn't going to the central bank to do what? Take a hit? The central bank of Brazil take a hit? Uh, right. Uh, uh, the question, the question is, uh, the United States has uh, huge deficits, and the dollar is the is the world reserve currency. How does that relate to what the Central Bank of Brazil will do, and how will we react to it, and uh, if it's going to take a hit as well or not? Yes, uh, yeah, that's a very, a very good question, a very complicated question. I think things are definitely connected uh, because, as you know, if the U.S. prints uh, money, this money travels to the rest of the world, for example, to Brazil, and the export lobby of, those, uh, of any country, Brazil also, would not want the currency to appreciate. So they would uh, make the politicians and the central bank to inflate at the same rhythm. Uh, and that's, that's what's the natural scenario. What, what's been happening in Brazil, it's not quite that yet. I think it may happen. Because the Brazilian currency was four to one dollar, and now it's 1.65 to one dollar. So it's, 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 it's accepting an amount of uh, shielding from the disaster management of uh, Ben Bernanke. Uh, but, uh, uh, but it can't do that indefinitely. Uh, it's a huge pressure. So the Brazilian Central Bank has been buying and, and has been increasing its uh, foreign exchange currencies and trying, uh, 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 dollars, and trying to sterilize that. But we know, all know that sterilize is only to postpone the problem. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a dilemma. But uh, I would say that one of the few areas that Brazil is, is good at is at uh, central banking management lately, over the, at least over the last eight years or so. So I think it, it will happen. This scenario will happen to other countries first, and Brazil may be protected. And the Brazilian central bank, as you were saying, holds uh, treasury bonds. And honestly, I don't see a better asset than you guys as, as uh, collateral. <laughs> You're still the best, most productive guys in the world. So the Central Bank of Brazil is doing really well. They could have bought gold, would be even better, but nobody's doing that. I don't know if there's much, um, that much gold to buy around without moving uh, prices. But the second best asset in the world are treasury bonds. Believe it or not, I know that's uh, you know, being polemical here, but it's definitely the, the best asset that you can have, because it's you and your children. <laughs> Thank you very much.